Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Cathedral. The Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. And with that, we invite you to come and worship with us here on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. Now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Our first reading is from the Psalter. God is my shepherd, I will have everything I need. God lets me rest in fields of green grass and leads me beside quiet waters. God makes me strong again. God leads me in the right way of right thinking and good living. Even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid of anything because God is with me. God has supplied me with means of comfort and support. God, has, God makes a table of celebration ready for me in front of those who hate me. God honors me with spiritual anointing. I have everything I need. Goodness and loving kindness certainly attend me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the divine presence forever. In these human words, God's voice is heard. God is with you. And also with you. A reading from the Gospel according to John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel, the good news. Jesus. He was wearing a cross. I mean, Jesus will not be wearing a cross just as much as uh, Moses will not be wearing the start of David. So, today we had a very interesting gospel reading. Jesus and his disciples and Jesus' mother were at a wedding. Now, the Gospel of John calls what happens here Jesus' first sign. And a sign is supposed to disclose who Jesus was, to let people know that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God. Now, what's interesting to me is that for this first sign, 
Jesus did not call a prayer meeting. He did not preach a great sermon. He didn't have a healing service. He didn't even have a scripture study. No. He gave them a lot of wine. Last and lots of them. How's that for a first impression? I have shared with you before that due to the, uh, uh, that due to the writer's theological conviction, uh, the Gospel of John is not one of my favorite Gospels. But this morning, I honestly have to confess that I find this first miracle of Jesus of turning water into wine being more exciting than the exorcism that other Gospels record as his first miracle. Because following a revolutionary, traveling by foot all day, fighting the crowds, not having a home, and knowing that I could be killed for the work that I do make things a little more easy for me if I know that at the end of the day there always be some good wine. <laughs> so in today's story, Jesus' mother comes to him with the terrible news that there is no more wine. And Jesus is like, and why are you coming to me? I'm not the wedding planner. In those times, it was customary for the guests to bring wine to the wedding. But something went wrong at this wedding. Either the guests did not bring enough wine or people were drinking too much too fast. Maybe some of my relatives were there. <laughs> so Jesus' mother comes to him very discreetly with the problem because if this news came out, this have, would have been very embarrassed, a very embarrassing situation. But how was this Jesus' problem? Well, he brought his disciples with him, who more than likely did not bring any wine, but were drinking lots of it. So he was responsible for his friends, who were reacting like a gang of first century wedding crashers. And so Jesus was persuaded by his mother to turn the water into wine, and not just any wine but good wine, and lots of it. They needed lots of it. Because back then, the wedding, they lasted about seven days, and this was only day number three. The story says that there were, about, that there were six jars, and each one of them took about 30 gallons. So there were about 180 gallons of wine. Wow. That is a great story. And that's what it was a story, a parable. The writer of the Gospel of John portrays Jesus as God. So he gives him attributes of a God, often bar borrowed from stories and myths. Those who follow the Roman god Dionysus said that he turned water into wine. And in fact, there are very interesting similarities between Christianity and the Dionysian religion. But that would be another sermon. But stories do not have to be factual to carry a message, a message of truth to the readers. John is known for the symbolism in his writing style. In this story, there are symbolisms that the readers for which this book was intended would have seen and understood immediately, which was the Johannine community. Immediately, they would have seen the words at the beginning of the story that says, on the third day. When the Johannine community read this, they would have immediately thought of the resurrection. It was intended for them to remember the resurrection and to focus on the positive. For them to know that the story of Jesus did not end it on his death. The day had the message of the resurrection. Number two, this story was a story of a wedding. To them, this was a symbolism of the marriage between God and God's people, the fulfillment of God's purpose.
for God's people. Here, John is reminding them of what Isaiah said in chapter 62, where it says, You shall not be called forsaken, and your land shall not be called desolated. You should be called, my delight is in her. Your land married. For God delights in you, and your land shall be married. And number three, a feast and wine symbolizes a time of celebration, joy, and abundance. Here the gospel writer again is recalling Isaiah 25, where it says, on this mountain, God will make for all the people a feast of rich food, a feast of well mature wines. And on Amos, where it says, the time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plucks shall overtake the one who reaps and the reader of grapes, the one who sows the seed, the mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. This story, this parable of Jesus turning water into wine is the message for his first reader to remember the resurrection and building from scripture to encourage them of their connection with God and to trust in the abundance and the joy and celebration that comes with it. Now we are not the Johannite community but we too can find truth and wisdom in this story. First, we look at those six stone jars that were filled with water that later turned into wine. Those jars were used for the ritual of cleansing. At the beginning of the wedding, those jars contained the water that the guests used to wash themselves. Those jars represented the religious law that the people clung to, and now they were just empty. But the radical Jesus, who liked to just turn things upside down, took those jars that represented the law and filled them with wine. Now they do not represent emptiness anymore. Now they represent abundance. How many times some of us allow ourselves to be empty and dry because we, because we cling to rituals, to traditions, to the past, and do not realize that we can live our lives more abundantly if we just allow ourselves to be filled with new possibilities? Number two, of all the places that this miracle could happen, it happened in Cana, a place that was considered so insignificant. That goes to show us that there is no place too insignificant for the unconditional love of God to reach out to us. And that no matter where we are in our life and in our journey, God is with us. Number three, Reverend Robert pointed out this week in our lectionary study that as we examine the rest of the story, we can be reminded that we need not to be dysfunctional and hit the panic button when, we, when things are not going as we plan. Rather, when we take the time to access the situation, the water to wine moment, more than likely, we will discover that we have more than enough for the immediate crisis, not only for the current situation, but for some abundance. And last, this story show us of the miracles that could happen when we work together, when we work in community. It took more than Jesus for this miracle to happen. Actually, Jesus only gave instructions. Mary was the one that identified the problem. She was the one that looked for solutions. The servants were the one who filled the jars with water. 
Jesus did not command the water to turn into wine. He did not even touch the jars. He did not even wave over it. He did not even say, now the water is wine. Why? Because miracles are not about God doing magic for us. Miracles are about us working together because what God does for us, God does through us. Like Mary, we see the problem and we look for a solution. And like the servant, we see what needs to be done and we work together. And that is how miracles happen. And so that is the purpose of this story and all the parables in the gospel, to convey a message. It was not meant as a historical event. But John is using symbolic writing for the first readers and for us today to look beyond the factual meaning. I find that comical when fundamentalists interpret this story literally and say something like, well, it was not really wine. Uh, Jesus would never do something like that. It was really just grape juice. Really? The story was talking about real wine, but it was just a parable. In the Gospels, we read about Jesus walking on water, raising the dead, calming the storm, turning water into wine. Scholar John Dominic Crossan said that if the gospel writers will hear our modern debates about the historical merits of these miracles, will say, they are parables, dummies. <laughs> Jesus taught using parables. We know that. No one would argue to the contrary. But so many people today reject the fact that the gospel writers who were influenced by the life and teachings of Jesus, also taught in parables through their writings. And they reject this because they want to have a Jesus that does magic. They want a supernatural Jesus. Well, the interesting thing is that Jesus was a revolutionary peasant who brought hope to those who did not have hope, who fought for those who could not fight for themselves, who taught about the unconditional love of God and humanity's sacred value, and who exposed and confronted the injustice and oppression of the political, social, religious powers, and in doing that, he lost his life and changed the world forever. That is who Jesus was. And the fact that he did that as a human being is the real miracle and the good news. Amen. This story, this parable of changing water into wine who also mean a calling about change in our lives. Maybe some of, you, some of you are being called to some change this morning, some change in your life. Maybe some of you are clinging to something that you need to let go of. Something that is hard to let go, but it's something that is hurting you. Or maybe some of you just want to step up and want to make miracles happen. Whatever it is, ministers are coming forward to anoint you with oil. Like we let you know every Sunday, there is no magic in the oil. It's just to let you know that the presence of God is always with you and that God is blessing you. So, please come forward. On the night you were betrayed, you took the bread. After giving thanks, you broke it and said, this is my body open to you. 
And as you eat this, remember me. This is my body, open to you. And as you eat this, remember me. On the night you were betrayed, you held the cup. As for giving thanks, you live, did it up. This is my life, poured out for you. And as you drink this, remember me. Recall the life you lived and the truth that you spread. Thank God, our Maker, oh heavenly dove. In Christ we celebrate your wondrous love. Thank God, our Maker, oh heavenly dove. In Christ we celebrate your wondrous love. At the Sunshine Cathedral, we practice an open communion, and what that means is you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to receive the sacrament. Just as you are with whatever your beliefs or doubts may be, you are welcome to participate in this feast of unconditional love. My friends, these are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello, I want to thank you for joining us for worship today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Again, if you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, please stop by and worship with us on Sundays at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to find out more about the Sunshine Cathedral, about our resources, or about our books published by our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Darrell Watkins, or if you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, may God continue to richly bless you on your journey. I have